So the question is, okay, blood pressure normalizes and things improve, people lose weight, they lose visceral fat, but is it safe? Is it really safe to put a person on a water-only fast for periods up to 40 days? And so to answer that question, we did a study. It's called a safety study, where we took every patient that underwent this protocol for five years and analyzed every patient, every symptom, every day, and then used um, an accepted standard in order to come up with uh, the results for this paper that was published in one of the peer-reviewed journals. And the common cr terminology criteria for adverse events from the National Cancer Institute was the standard that was used. And that means every patient's symptom every day has to be categorized into these five uh, grades, mild, moderate, severe, life-threatening consequences, or death. So if you have a mild symptom or symptoms that day, they, they get categorized as a category one adverse event, et cetera. Um, we had 5,949 total adverse events in all of the uh, patients that underwent fasting during that period of time. There were no category five events, so nobody died. Uh, there was one category four event. This actually was a case of what's called hyponatresis. Uh, the sodium levels went low. We had to uh, re-element this person with uh, added sodium in order to bring their salt levels back to normal. They did fine. 310 category three events. Interestingly enough, a third of those were what are called hypertensive crises. A hypertensive crisis is any time your systolic blood pressure goes over 160. So you might ask, well, why would 100 or more people have blood pressure over 160 if they're fasting, since fasting is used as a treatment for high blood pressure? So the way this works is any day your blood pressure is over 160 is considered an adverse event. So if a patient comes in and their blood pressure starts at, say, 220, and the next day it's 200, and the next day it's 190, and the next day it's 180, and the next day it's 170, each one of those days is an adverse event, okay, even though clearly it's coming down. And so that's where uh, those category three events came from. Category one and category two events are the symptoms we expect to see in fasting, low back pain, headache, nausea, all kinds of detox symptoms that are uh, annoying but not threatening. 95% of adverse events are considered mild to moderate, and the conclusions of the study were that uh, most of the events are not only mild and moderate, but they're the ones we expect that are known to occur during fasting, that there's a slight correlation between the numbers of adverse events and aging, but no correlation between the severity of events and aging. And this was very important, because until this study was done, nobody over age 65 could be allowed to fast in a, in a approved study, because there was no safety data suggesting that it was safe. So if you were 65 or older, you were too old to be able to go through this process supposedly. Now we know that there's no more chance because you're 75 than if you're 35 of having a serious event and as a consequence people are able to fast with a broader age range. And as uh, the True North Health Center's protocol has been shown to be uh, safe. Uh, so how is it possible that doing nothing like fasting could have a bigger impact on the leading contributing cause of death and disability than just about anything that's been shown? What percentage of people do you think that do water-only fasting lose weight? I know that sounds kind of quacky, doesn't it? 100% effective. But we know from the laws of physics and thermodynamics, if you don't eat, you're going to lose weight. Although I did have a patient one time who said that she wouldn't lose weight. So what do you mean you won't lose weight? She goes, no, she's been on all kinds of diets. She never loses weight. I said, so you're going to violate the laws of physics and therm thermodynamics? And she said, yeah. So she went on a fast. First day, what happened? She went up a pound. She was so excited. <laughs> she felt vindicated. She said, see, Dr. Goldhammer, even water fasting, I gain weight. So she held a little fluid that day. She ended up losing a pound a day just like everybody else. Average weight loss is about a pound a day. And as we know now from the, the slide I showed you previously, we know that the net effect is going to be mostly fat loss and in particular uh, visceral fat. Uh, naturesis is the selective elimination of sodium that accumulates in the body. Uh, and sodium is a, is a real problem because excess sodium causes increased blood volume, which increases blood pressure, which is why people eating salt have a higher uh, problem with blood pressure. It also causes edema and swelling, and not just conditions like 
congestive heart failure, but also uh, it makes your arthritic pain and joint pain worse. It causes wounds not to heal. Um, it stimulates passive overeating, so it results in obesity and other problems as well. But the, this excess salt is selectively mobilized early on in fasting, and that's why you'll see people lose actually significant amount, amounts of weight, which is mostly water initially because of this excess uh, fluid that's been retained to neutralize the effects of the sodium in the body. Um, detoxification, are people really toxic? Is that true? If you like took a fat biopsy of people, would you find several hundred different chemicals in various concentrations? Things like PCB and dioxin and pesticide residues and heavy metals, et cetera? Yeah, it turns out we're accumulating these. In fact, the single biggest source of toxicity for the average person, uh, besides drugs and, and those types of things, is actually their diet and in particular eating animal foods. It turns out that animal foods biologically concentrate the toxins from their environment, from their feed, from their treatment, and it builds up day after week after month. So when you eat an animal, you get its entire lifetime accumulation of toxins. Um, in fact, if you look at it calorie by calorie, if you look at a calorie of plant foods and a calorie of animal foods, that animal food could have anywhere from two to a thousand times the concentration of various chemicals because of this concept of biological concentration. And in fasting, the body rapidly begins to mobilize and eliminate these toxic products. In fact, some authors have suggested that you should never fast because the fast is so efficient at detoxification, it will overload your body's ability to keep up with it. Unless you take their proprietary products, then of course, then apparently it becomes safe. But that's not been our experience, of course. Um, the body's well equipped to do fasting. Fasting is actually a biological adaptation. Uh, humans had to be able to fast because our huge bulbous neuronal nets at the end of our spinal column called the brain is a big burner of glucose. It's our biggest burner of glucose, a major burner of energy. And so if humans with our huge brains didn't have the ability to fast, we could never have wandered away from the tropics. We'd be like um, um, other primates that you never see leave the primates because they need constant source of fuel because their brain doesn't convert to burning fat. It just burns glucose. Humans have this adaptation where we can burn fat. So the average, uh, even a thin male can fast up to 70 days. So it allowed us to wander away from the tropics and survive. If not, the very first time spring came late, all the humans would have died. In fact, that's probably exactly what happened, which is why today humans as a part of our genetic characteristics have this ability to fast. And all we've done is taken this very natural ability and used it in a very abnormal, unnatural circumstance. And that's a circumstance where people are getting exposed to dietary excess. It doesn't really happen in a natural setting. Um, fasting also induces enzymatic changes. Like, have you ever wondered, like, if you want to burn fat storage, how does that happen? Well, it happens through a call, process called lipolysis, which is enzymatically driven. And when you go on a fast, you induce those enzyme systems of fat mobilization, including visceral fat mobilization. And what's interesting is even when you're done fasting, you're still more efficient at inducing fat mobilization than you were before fasting. It's very much like athletes become uh, more efficient at mobilizing glycogen stores. You know, that's why they go through carb loading and, and, and training. They get better at utilizing their glycogen stores and mobilizing those because they induce those enzyme pathways through their vigorous activity that induces uh, them to change. And those enzyme systems persist after fasting. So you're not just more efficient at mobilizing glycogen and fat during fasting, but after fasting. And every time you fast, it appears to be cumulative. And it's not just uh, endogenous uh, enzyme systems, but also exogenous. How do you think you get those toxins out of your body? Most detoxifying pathways are enzymatically driven. So when you go on a fast and you begin doing this detoxification process that can make you kind of feel miserable, uh, it, those enzyme systems also appear to persist. And so you'll continue to detoxify more efficiently weeks and months after you've completed fasting. And in fact, that may be one of the mechanisms why intermittent fasting may be helpful, even that 12 to 16 hour period that you can do every day, because it may induce some of these changes that accumulatively uh, persist. And so when people fast, they detoxify, and after people fast, they are more efficient detoxifiers.